Um, so what I want to do this evening is I want to talk a little bit about who am I, um, what department am I in, what am I doing with archaeology, a little bit about archaeology at UCSB. How can we bring the ancient world to life here in the 21st century, um, digitally or not, and what it is about archaeology. We'll, talk, we'll start off with a little bit about kind of the history of archaeology, exactly what it is, um, and then we'll move to some, some, some sites that I've worked at, and we'll, we'll end uh, here at UCSB. So, I am Professor Claudia Moser. I, I teach in the History of Art and Architecture Department, and I am one of two archaeologists now in the History of Art and Arch Architecture Department. Most of my field work has been in Italy, and I really, uh, I, I dig as, as in the summers and in the school year I teach, and in the summers I dig. Okay, okay so here's my first uh, volunteer question. And I'm, I am not able to see people's, Janie, I'm not able to see people's raising their hands. So I'm gonna ask you if, if you won't mind um, to kind of be the person who sees people's uh, answer. So can anyone volunteer to give me a definition of archeology? span not like a dictionary definition, whatever you think of art. Oh, I can see it. Okay, good, awesome. Um, let's see, here we go. Wow, okay, so um, I'm gonna use people's first names and only their first names if that's okay with everyone. So Noah has said this definition of archeology span is the study of human history and prehistory through excavation of sites and analysis of artifacts and other physical remains. Awesome, we have some great archeological words here, artifacts, excavations. Um, Sam has said that it is the study of remains or bones. Great. Um, we look at all kinds of remains, um, building remains, bones. Um, this picture that you're looking at below, which we'll look at a little bit more later this evening, um, definitely had some bones. Any other things that people want to add? Okay. Um, those are all Super Noah and Sam, thank you both for being um, valiant and brave volunteers here. Um, you guys are correct. So technically, I guess the, the dictionary definition, one of them that I like is the past tense of cultural anthropology or the study of human and societies through their material culture. So as Noah said, looking at their physical remains, um, what can we learn about our culture? Not necessarily through text, not necessarily through images, but, but what about objects? What do the objects or bones tell us about it? Do I have any questions at this point? I know I just started. Okay. So a little bit about the history of archaeology. So even though archaeology kind of was happening always even the, in, in antiquity, the first scientific excavation actually occurred here in the U.S. with Thomas Jefferson in the 18th century. And there were these mounds that Thomas Jefferson saw on the east of the Mississippi. And he said, you know, I'm really curious what these are. There was this whole mystery about these mounds and the people who may have built these mounds, these mound builders. What could these mounds be? And no one ever could have thought that, no, 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 no. They could not have been dug by the, uh, created by the indigenous Native Americans. So Thomas Jefferson said, no, I think there might be, they're not so mysterious, let's actually, excavate them. And so he, there's a quote that, that I have on the screen here, right? And he wished to satisfy whether any of these, um, and which of these opinions were just. And for this purpose, it, he determined to open and examine it thoroughly. So what Thomas Jefferson did is, and you can see in the image on the right-hand side of the screen, he wanted to look at these mounds and excavate them from the top down. So kind of peeling off layers one by one. Because if you kind of think about digging a hole um, in, the, in the dirt, if you just dig a hole, you kind of mix up all the layers. But Thomas Jefferson and, and scientific excavation from then on really thought about peeling back the layers. And this is called, is it actually, does anyone know what this is called? What the study of layers or what layers are called in archeology? span Stratigraphy. Um, so stratigraphy, ah, sorry, I wasn't, oh my gosh, sorry, you were right, Jared and Noah, awesome, um, we got stratigraphy from Jared and Noah, definitely knew that it was strata, yeah, um, a strata is the actual layer, 
And stratigraphy, as Jared said, is the study of the layers. Awesome. So stratigraphy is, so an archeological site is made up of different layers. And both of these very different images that I have on the screen show you different layers. Um, if you look at the one on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see if I, here. Um, you can see here um, that this, starting from like the bottom here up to here, is one color, right? And then from here to another is another color. From here to here, it goes up like this, is another color. Um, there are slight variations and gradations in color or consistency, but those are all different strata, and they all have different things inside of them. And the study of the different layers is called stratigraphy. And so what, why stratigraphy and scientific excavation is important is because you want to kind of, somewhat like an onion, peeling off the layers of the onion, you want to start with the topmost layer and make sure, so if we're looking at this layer here, this sandy kind of lightish sandy layer, you want to make sure that you get to the bottom of it. And it's higher over here and it's deeper over here. But before you continue deeper, say on this side, you want to make sure that you can, that you excavate the entire so instead of looking at dirt, which all kind of, you know, I'm talking about various gradations of dirt here, it's easiest to think about a laundry basket. Okay, you are all going to college next year and you will be doing your own laundry. Now, what happens is, think about you have a pair of jeans at the bottom of your laundry basket and you have this striped shirt on the top of your laundry basket. You have to think about which is older and which is newer. Your jeans at the bottom of your laundry basket most likely are older. You haven't worn them for a longer time, whereas the shirt on top perhaps you've worn maybe yesterday. In a similar way, what stratigraphy tells us is the topmost layers are the most recent and the bottom are the oldest. Any questions on that before I, before I move on? Okay, so just kind of zooming through a little like best uh, highlights of, of archaeological excavation to get us up to today. In the 18th and 19th century, Napoleon's military expedition at the end of the 18th and early 19th century to Egypt, there wasn't much excavation, but there was very, uh, there was a lot of exploration. So there was looking at the pyramids, there was the discovery of this Rosetta stone, um, this stone in, in three different languages, and, and to be able to transcribe and identify and translate hieroglyphics, the Egyptian language, for the first time. About uh, a little under 100 years later, this guy named Heinrich Schliemann dressed uh, characteristically in his fur coat there and his black top hat, excavated the site of Troy, which is famous for, um, from Homer's Iliad and Homer's Odyssey. Now, great that he excavated this for us. Um, it's, it's in Turkey, it's on the coast of Turkey. Here's Istanbul in Turkey, just kind of to somewhat orient us, and here, here is Troy. The problem with Schliemann was that he did not excavate stratigraphically. He did not do kind of layer by layer. He was really all about finding treasure. Um, this quote from his excavation journal from 1873 really says it all. In order to withdraw the treasure from the greed of my workmen and to save it for archaeology, I cut out the treasure with a large knife. So he found all this gold and he says, okay, workmen, go off for lunch. It's mine. This woman down here, that's his wife, and she's wearing all of the gold that he found. So Schliemann had some questionable, let's just say, um, excavation methods. So let's see if I can, how many of you have been to Pompeii? And do you guys know about the raising hand function? Maybe that, maybe that works, if that doesn't. Oh yes, it does work. Okay, I got Okay, two of you have been to Pompeii. Um, Sarah or Tara, would one of you feel comfortable writing in the chat function just a little bit, like one word that talks about your impression of Pompeii? And you don't have to if you don't want to because I'm putting you on the spot here.
or actually I'll open it up to other people who might want to volunteer as well. Does anyone, anything that people know about Pompeii or their impressions from books like this or from movies? Feel free to add that to the chat. Okay, extensive, we got some categories, said thank you to Sarah and Tara. Um, extensive, yes, it is quite extensive. And Tara said that uh, she remembers seeing that even the mosaics and frescoes were preserved, which is amazing. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of incredible the state of preservation, what's there, and we'll look at a couple pictures. Um, and, and Sam contributed that it's a town that went under and that it's, Haley, thank you, um, that it's near a volcano, and, and that's kind of how it met its demise. Um, Emma, thank you, a, a treasure trove of artifacts. Yeah, these are all totally accurate, and this is why Pompeii has really fascinated us as archaeologists, as just people, um, still to this day. The idea of um, kind of what Sam was talking about, and, and that it's went under, and and Tara as well, that, that um, these things are preserved. It's a city frozen in time. So what happened was in 79 AD, um, Mount Vesuvius, a huge volcano, as Hallie pointed out, erupted um, with, very, with very little warning, and it covered the town of Pompeii in volcanic ash. And that ash um, killed many, killed all of the people living in Pompeii at the time, but was ironically what preserved it for us today. So how did archaeologists find Pompeii? Um, there are many movies about the last days of Pompeii and this idea of um, the volcano coming and who are we saving. But in the early days of Pompeii, um, Pompeii was first excavated, um, I use that term very lightly, um, in mid-18th century. And at this point, archaeology was more about tourism or leisure class and, and less about scientific excavation. And so you can see up here in this image um, the idea of there was, no, there was no pulling off the layers. There was no stratigraphy. Instead, um, as Emma pointed out, they were looking for artifacts. They were looking for the treasure trove of artifacts. And what they did in this period in the early 17th and 18th century is they tunneled. So they tunneled their way through buildings and through the ground, losing all kinds of kind of context or information about dates, right? Because the top most is the most recent and the bottom most is the oldest. So if you kind of drill down, you mix them all together. So all that was lost because they were tunneling in order to get to all these goodies, right? Um, as Tara was saying, these, these, these frescoes, like this woman that you see up here, or these beautiful silver cups down here. Here's another fresco, and here you can see an area that was tunneled right through the fresco wall. Any questions? Okay. So part of what, um, oh, Awesome. Um, what about Herculaneum? Um, Noah asks. So Herculaneum, I'm going to go back. Here we go. Herculaneum. So here's Pompeii. It's right kind of totally in this, and this uh, shadowed area shows the, what was covered in the eruption of Vesuvius. Herculaneum is right here. It's a nearby town that was also covered by Vesuvius, which is here when it erupted. Um, Herculaneum is much smaller than um, Pompeii. Sarah mentioned that Pompeii was really extensive. Herculaneum is much, much smaller. It's still incredibly well preserved. Uh, a similar level of mosaics and frescoes. And actually, if any of you uh, venture to Pompeii or to, I strongly recommend going to Herculaneum. It has a lot less tourists these days. Um, and a lot, well, every place has a lot less tourists these days. But I mean, before uh, our current situation, uh, it's, it's a lot smaller. Uh, the houses are the houses are somewhat smaller than at Pompeii. They're a little less rich, um, but a number of the frescoes are still well preserved. Other questions? So what I'm showing you on the screen um, are plaster casts of bodies, because I said that this volcano erupted with no warning. So um, Herculaneum, um, so i sorry, I just got another question from Tara, thank you. Um, Herculaneum, was Herculaneum excavated later than Pompeii? Um, it was excavated, you know, I actually don't know the answer to that question. 
they were, they thought they were excavating, and when they were excavating Pompeii, they actually thought they were excavating another town. They thought they were excavating this town called Stabia, but then they found an inscription, which is kind of an archaeologist archaeologist dream that said this is basically this is the town of Pompeii so they knew that they were digging Pompeii but for about 15 years they thought they were digging Stabium. Herculaneum I think was after I think Herculaneum started real excavations in um, in the 19th century but I'm not totally sure. Awesome question Tara. Um, so these plaster casts um, they they what one of the later excavators or later workers at the site was trying to preserve the organic remains of the human bodies. And so he developed a technique to pour plaster into the cavities um, before they were excavated, right? They would pour um, plaster into the cavities and then the shape of the bodies would come out. And that might be some of that idea of pathos or that idea of you know, our feeling that we can actually relate to the, to the town of Pompeii. Um, it wasn't just people, it was also dogs. Um, really, really sad images of dogs, um, plaster casts of dogs caught in the pyroclastic blow. Now, kind of jumping forward 300 years, uh, there's the question of who owns Pompeii. And a large part of archeology span has, transferred into cultural heritage and preservation. Um, there are a number of articles, and if you guys are interested after, after this, little, uh, this little session, I encourage you to just Google search for Pompeii and rain and houses tumbling. Um, there are a number of stories about Pompeii, destruction that's happening at Pompeii um, because of rain. Rains are kind of collapsing houses or the number of tourists actually there are a number of stories about tourists kind of jumping over fences and stealing mosaics and and destroying things um, so it's a large question of how do we control how do we preserve the site for another 2,000 years um, can we um, who gets to see it do we control there's a number of uh, corporate sponsorships as well Okay, that was a lot of information um, thrown at you in a short amount of time. Does anyone have any questions so far? I want to show you a little bit about different sites that I've worked at just to give a sense of um, different types of archaeology that's out there aside from just digging. Ah, so Sam asked, how are the bodies not completely melted? Um, so they were, they, the organic material, so I am, I am an archaeologist, I am not a forensic specialist, but from what I understand, um, when the volcanic eruption happened and covered the, the town in ash and lava, um, when they were excavating through this, what happened was the organic material in, from the bodies had disintegrated such that they, it would make a cavity in the, in the hard lava right, there'd be an open space. And so by pouring in plaster cast into that cavity, the shape of the body would come out. But that's from what I understand. I am not a scientist, so that might be a very, very under, uh, underrepresented uh, answer. Okay, so where have I worked as an archeologist? What, what kinds of things can you do if you want to become an archeologist? So first, let's talk about Greece. Um, one of the sites I worked at is in this small hilltop. So we worked on this hill for eight weeks. Here's Athens. This is where the site is. It's called Mount Lycaon. And what it was, and this gets back to, let's see, who said bones in the beginning? Um, Sam was saying the remains of bones. Um, what it is, is this whole black area here. This whole is all the ash of burned animals. Because in antiquity, what they did when they were having um, a, a ritual, a religious festival, is they would burn animals to the gods. And the smoke would reach the gods, and that's how they would have some kind of ritual. Oftentimes, those bones were buried. Sometimes they were burnt into, a, a, into an ash um, as much as possible. And here, what they think they had, they think they had actually an ash altar. So the accumulation of ash of the animals over time. So we were digging as a team up here, this ash altar made of animal bones. It was very dirty. 
We were constantly filthy. We had to use these things. They're like a pasta strainer to sift everything um, to make sure that we were finding all the objects um, because they would, not only were there animal bones, but there are also very many precious objects that were offered here. Beautiful um, vistas. That's one of the things archaeology gives you. It gives you these beautiful, beautiful places, usually beautiful places to go um, in the hot sun. Sometimes the hot sun made us do uh, enact our own types of sacrifice. And this is when we're sacrificing. This gentleman here is our trench supervisor. And there were certain days when we really did feel like uh, sacrificing him up there on the heat. Archaeology, though, doesn't have to just be about digging. So what this gentleman is doing here is he's doing something called flotation. And what that is, is it's basically here's a barrel full of water and he pours in a pile of dirt and he uses a, a fine grain, uh, a fine grain sifter or a fine grain sieve and he runs water through it. And what comes out, this is especially used to find seeds and and evidence from uh floral and uh not sometimes faunal but mostly floral remains pollen things like that 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 would be really hard for us to pick out of the dirt individually this gentleman here is an architect so we as archaeologists we often rely on architects to come and draw what we're digging because these are different skill sets conservation is a big one so this was one of um this was one of the uh, bronze hand with a, a gold, we're not exactly, uh, sorry, a silver something. And this was found in that on the top of the mountain that I was showing. Um, the sifting technique, Joseph asked the question, is a sifting technique like sifting dirt through gold? Exactly. Um, so if you think of kind of a big sifter or a big straw, and you pour a lot of dirt in it and just shake it. Um, probably if we did this in our backyards, what would come out would be lots of little pebbles. Um, when you do this at an archeological site, bones come out or tiny little um, shards of ceramic can come out as well. Great questions. So museums, curation, um, these two uh, ladies here right here are specialists in conservation. And so they take the finds that we find in the field and they make sure that they're documented, that they, that they can be preserved um, over time. So from the very, very uh, remote location of a hilltop in, in Greece, another site that I have worked at is urban archaeology in the city of Rome. So smack dab in the city, this site is called Sanima Bono. Um, here it is, and if any of you have been to Rome, this is the Tiber River. Um, the Forum is just right over, right over here. The Forum and the Colosseum is a little bit off this, but it's over here. Uh, this site had its own challenges, aside from it being in the middle of a city and tour buses passing us constantly, um, asking us what we were doing. It was originally dug in, it was originally, let's say, discovered in the 19, let's, where is that picture? In the 1930s, um, there we go, um, in the 1930s, and when they were building these office buildings in the back. And from the 1930s until now, there were many different piecemeal excavations. Um, some over here, some over here, some over here. So the current project was to kind of get at the original layers. So these darker parts in purple were dug in the medieval period actually, and they had medieval objects in them. So we had to kind of dig those out first to understand what else was going on. And archaeology does involve a lot of sweeping because you have to, you know, get through one layer, clean it up, and then move to the next. Um, so uh, this site was constantly, we had all these different holes. It was a very um, stratigraphically complex and confusing one to dig at. Um, shoveling was a big part of it. Um, this is a total station and sometimes if you're driving on the streets or on the highway, you'll see people using these today. It's a way to record digitally um, different ge geographic locations. Um, so what this gentleman is doing is he's actually um, pinpointing our, our site so that he can digitally map it. And so we can have a digital record of the actual architecture and plant of the site. This site was really close to the Tiber. So you could only dig down a certain level. If you dig below six meters, you would hit water, as you see here, because it's close to the water table. And so they had to, at one point, use 
basically it was like a big huge vacuum that that you had to go down to suck out the water so that they could excavate low enough to see the earliest layers of the site i'll stop does anyone have any questions before i move on to something that um people might be familiar with from certain movies Okay, how many of you, let's do another, uh, see if we can raise our hands thing. Um, how many of you have been, have, have heard or seen Petra before? Yeah, awesome. Um, many, many more hands come up here. Um, a lot of it is, I'm guessing, from what we see on the screen, Indiana Jones, probably most, or Transformers. Um, what they're doing in Petra right now is not actively digging, but rather something called landscape survey. So this is something if you know you're interested in archaeology, but you're not really interested in digging, what happens is that you oftentimes they go hand in hand, but before you dig, you walk in a line spaced at a certain distance apart. So sometimes 10 feet, sometimes 20 feet, and you walk a set distance and you pick up things from the ground because plowing modern plowing churns up ancient stuff constantly so this woman here is walking and here's another person here they're walking at that distance and they walk a certain just maybe 100 yards at a time and count certain things on the ground or or pick up certain things or diagnostic things and what that does is it gives you a sense of where there's a cluster of artifacts or a cluster of information, maybe another team later on would want to come back and dig. At Petra also, we had to do some drawing of, of the sites as well. So these people are measuring the distance from you know, one area to another, from one rock, it looks like, to another wall, and then creating that in a drawing so that we could document for future, um, for future scholarship what was happening. Also looking at rock features. What, what, what can we tell? These are non-invasive techniques. Um, archaeology, a lot of people say archaeology is destruction because once you dig it up, you can't do it back. Landscape survey and looking for features like, um, this person right here is climbing what looks to be kind of like a canal and their little steps here. And so um, people in antiquity had carved different aspects, things, little stairs, little shrines into the rocks around Petra. Okay, questions about any of kind of different kinds of archeological opportunities outside UCSB before we think about how we can bring the ancient world to UCSB. Ooh, my favorite site I've worked. I love Italy, so I'd have to say Rome. So yeah, that actually, that wasn't my favorite site that I worked at because it had its own difficulties being um, quite confusing stratigraphically and in the middle of the city. But I worked at a site an hour south of Rome. Uh, it was a villa of an emperor, and that was a fantastic, really, really fun site to work at. Actually, it was actually where I learned ar about archaeology. Other questions? Oh, wait, here we go. I got another one. Um, have you run into much legal troubles with excavations, people claiming ownership? Great question, Emma. Um, legal trouble with excavations. I would say on a weirdly bureaucratic level, yes. Um, just the Italian government has to grant you as an American or whoever permission to dig in their country. And so sometimes those kind of permissions can get stalled or... Um, delayed and so that is that sometimes happens with legal in terms of ownership no because um say we find something say we find a statue in an excavation that i'm digging at in greece or in italy we can't bring it back to the states with us for study it stays in the country of origin so there's no more bringing it back to study it's very much theirs thanks for your question emma jared asks um are sites for excavation getting fewer and fewer or are there still a lot out there Surprisingly, Jared, um, I get this question all the time. There are a ton still out there. Um, I am starting a, I'm starting a field project for undergrad students at UCSB at a site about mm, 10 minutes outside. It still counts as being in the city of Rome, but it's kind of a little bit on the outskirts. And some of the sites have been dug before, um, Jared, like 
like we saw with Senna Bono in Rome, but they haven't been dug um, in many years or there are new questions being answered or it was just a part of it was being dug. So I think that there are tons of opportunities for new excavations. Um, Anika asks, how often do you actually find anything? You know, it really depends on where you're digging. In the site in Greece where I was on the mountaintop, we would find like things every 30 minutes, like beautiful little gold trinkets and all that stuff. In Rome, I probably, in six weeks of digging, I probably found one thing one summer. Um, very, very not so, not so often because that site had been dug a lot more. And Tara asks, how do you become part of an excavation and a research team? Awesome. Um, first, well, if you come to UCSB, you talk to me um, because, um, or my colleague Alicia Boswell, who uh, is an archaeologist who works in Peru. Um, because if we aren't currently running a field project, we have colleagues around the country and around the world actually who are and who are always looking for active student volunteers and participants. Um, we also know a number of resources where you can search for. Um, I can actually write this and you guys can look at it. There's something called archaeological.org. It's the Archaeological Institute of America. And they have um, on their website, you can say for search field work opportunities and you can search for whether or not you want to be a volunteer, whether or not you want uh, course credit, how long you want to go for and where in the world you want to go. So anywhere from California to Brazil to Italy. Um, and they kind of list all the opportunities there. More questions. Um, how old does I have to be to qualify for an archaeological excavation? Would, say, a 1940s era World War II battlegrounds be off, on or off the table? I think anything counts as an archaeological excavation, Noah. Um, there are uh, companies around the country called uh, Cultural Resource Management, CRM, and they're archaeologists who um, say uh, an electric company is build a new electric line and they dig in something they call this company and they these professional just come out and dig so archaeologists archaeological excavation could be anything um from you know five years i don't even know i don't i think it's i think let's just say a world war a 1940s era world war ii battleground would certainly be on the table for excavation um, these are great questions. Cindy asks, what is the strategy behind collecting certain sites? So some of that is you kind of take a lot of different information. Um, with technology increasing, there's a lot more of um, things like aerial photography. So um, when planes are flying overhead or something that's really fun that if you guys want that you can do on your own time is if you go into Google Earth, you can kind of do flyovers. Um, one of the assignments I give my archaeology classes to take off all place locators and we do kind of a what what site is this quiz um, and fly over places and through just Google Earth, you you can see the formation of sites um, just even just in the for if there's something like a, a wall or a or a brick or a stone foundation underneath where grass is growing that grass isn't going to be growing as high as other places where they're not so even the coloring of sites from the sky can tell us so that's one thing we use we also use things like literature i mean say an ancient roman author is talking about a villa of a famous emperor and he tells you it's on this road um he could be making it up but if you use that in combination with other things, um, like landscape survey, um, walking walking around there and seeing what, what it looks like is another good way. A couple more questions here. Um, what kind of job prospects are there for archaeology majors? And are you limited to joining digs? Absolutely not. Um, I think a lot of people go on, either you love digging or you hate digging. Um, so if you, you don't like it, 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 I think a lot of just go into museums and actually in the department we have a new museum studies minor so you can minor in museum studies or you can major in art history and and have an emphasis in museum studies a lot of our undergrads um, focus on museum studies and archaeologists um, are really well suited for that kind of work so that's another thing that are, are and I think in terms of job prospects Archaeology, what archaeology and art history really teach you to do is close looking um, and it really teaches you to think about the whole surrounding or the whole context of an object. Like if you find um, 
a metal cup surrounded with other little pieces of pottery, you're able to create a history or a story of that. And I think that that kind of skill of looking at all the artifacts around you really could apply to many, many different jobs and many different professions. Um, what is the most interesting artifact I've ever found? I have no idea. Um, I don't know, that's a really good question. You have stumped me. Um, another question, um, what are some technology, ways technology has altered the way you approach archeology span and research? It has totally changed the way. So when I was an undergrad taking archeology span classes, I took one archeology span class and said, I wanna major in this. Um, there was not really the same level of technology. Maps were starting to come out, kind of interactive maps were starting to come out, but that really developed while I was um, getting my PhD in grad school. And I think the way a lot of things are digital, and I think a lot of projects are open source, meaning that um, if someone's excavating a site now and they make a map of it that's linked with objects and images um, and research and articles about it, that's really shared among the archaeological community. Um, and so that's, that's one of the ways that technology has altered um, the, the way that we're sharing it and finding sites to go back to Cindy's question. Okay, so here at UCSB, right? What are, what what can, what can we what what are ways that let's say I bring the ancient world to life? Um, so some of them is recreation. So in a class that I taught um, that I teach on ancient spectacle, and the students decided from from week one of our quarter that they wanted to create an ancient Roman dinner party and uh, an animal sacrifice. So um, I know you can't visit UCSB right now, but this is Stork Plaza, kind of right in the center of our campus. And, and we decided that we would process from our classroom to Stork Plaza and different participants would take different roles. And we had a, a, a elaborate animal sacrifice of our pig pinata over here. Um, we had a Roman dinner party complete with Roman food that um, some of our participants made from ancient Roman recipes. And we all processed and, and kind of chanted as we walked there. Um, it brought quite a crowd. Um, they had, the dinner party had an elaborate um, um, ceremony where the performer ended up stealing all the wine of the participants. Wine, grape juice. Um, <laughs> the, in a class that I taught this past, fall for freshmen. Um, it was a class that I co-taught with a professor in religious studies and he works on modern Mumbai religion. Um, as you can tell, very, very different in time period and location from what I work on. But we, we were teaching them about different kind of ways that rituals and in cities interact. And so we wanted our students to create their own ritual. And they came up with, because they were freshmen, they wanted to um, incorporate ways that they were being initiated into UCSB and emblems of UCSB. So at UCSB, we have a really big bike culture here. Um, so our five, our five actors who, who chose to be actors in, in our procession um, rode their bikes from our classroom as we followed them and played musical instruments and, and kazoos and drums around our lagoon. And we, we rode all the way and walked all the way to the beach because our actors were going to jump into the ocean because they wanted that and this was in the first week of December. And, and actually, it's rare, um, you have to just take my word on this, it's rare that Santa Barbara skies look this cloudy. Um, but it was very brave of them. You can see all of us are dressed much more warmly than they are. Um, and they, they jumped into the ocean. Um, and they came out and they, their, the costume creators had given them face paint, blue face paint, and they were to wipe it off to symbolize kind of their new kind of rebirth to, to UCSB. And of course, we feasted afterwards. Our food group had created um, the four seasons of food at UCSB, um, four things that were characteristic for, or, or different kinds of foods that were characteristic of UCSB and Santa Barbara. And another way, and this hopefully will uh, pertain to all of you, is that coming in fall 2020, so you could register for this soon, um, is a new way, and this goes back to one of, I think it was Tara's question about um, technology. What are the ways that technology has affected how I research and, and do archeology? span It also has affected the way that I'm teaching. So in um, a new course that I'm developing um, with another professor in the writing program here at UCSB is called Roam the Game. It'll be a narrative-based game that looks at the art and archeology span of Rome, 
And in it, you as an undergraduate student will play the role of a graduate student going to Rome for the first time. And you are, your, your mission, I guess we could call it, is that the, a certain prestigious museum in Southern California has asked you to find out as much information as you can about a certain statue. And you are going to go to different sites throughout the city of Rome um, to find out some information about that. And you end up yourself on an archaeological dig, which you'll be digitally digging. Um, and eventually you get chased by some tomb robbers and some illegal looters. And you get into that world as well. So that is one uh, new development on the horizon that hopefully will entice all of you if you do uh, come to UCSB to take. It is being listed in, in the, my department, the History of Art and Architecture, as Art History 6A. Um, it is open to all years, freshmen. Um, it's, it's very much an introductory course, so um, it will be a great place to start. And it covers four GEs, so uh, knock them out early. Um, and finally, just one other kind of thing that we're doing here at UCSB is I've created a mock trench. Um, and again, if we were having this on campus, we, I would take you guys out to the back of the arch building right now and we would practice digging this. Um, but I created this a couple years ago and these are colleagues and a graduate student in the art history department who helped me create this. Um, so it, there, this is a resource for you at UCSB, which I use in my classes, um, which we dig together and we, we find things. Um, this probably by now will have disintegrated, but if you remember, that is our pig pinata from, from our sacrifice um, in Stork Plaza. So that is all I have to, I've been talking for a while. So does anyone have any other questions for me? Anything that I can answer? Anything about UCSB? Anything about the art history department? Any questions at all? So Noah asks, can you minor in anthropology and go on jigs? Noah, I'm going to ask you um, anthropology or art history. And while Noah's answering me that, I'm going to, um, anthropology. Yes, anthropology does have um, digs. I think, um, and another person has asked me, do I work closely with the anthro department? So yes, I do. Um, anthropology, um, at least here at UCS, well, that's not true. We have one. Um, I work closely. One of the colleagues, one of my close colleagues in anthropology is an Egyptian archaeologist. Um, so in terms of time period, he and I do work closely together. And yes, you can minor in anthropology and go on digs. The digs that anthropology have are more, um, they have some digs in South America. They're doing a dig actually here in Santa Barbara. So they're not, uh, they don't have any Mediterranean digs. So it's, and they're a little bit more modern um, with respect to that term than what I work on. Um, so yes, you can mine, definitely you can minor in anthropology and go on digs. Um, and yes, I do work closely with the anthropology department um, as well as does my other colleague in the department. Um, Annika asked, uh, tomb robbers, actually something you have to deal with? Um, yes, actually. Um, not so much in a site like, in an urban site like Rome, but in that um, hilltop in Greece where I worked, there were mornings that we would come out where there would be holes, pockmarked holes in the site, um, because people knew that we were there. It's a very small town. They knew that we were digging there, and they would come out in the middle of the night with metal detectors. And there was, there was lots of metal there. And so they would find the metal and they would dig. And unfortunately, not only does that lose artifacts for us, but what that really does is it really disrupts the context because they're digging, just like in, in Pompeii, tunneling through, they're digging holes. Other questions? <coughs> So what I will say is this, um, I don't, I, I don't want to put anybody else on the spot, um, but I also know that questions might come up or questions might come up afterwards. Um, my email address is down here at the bottom of the screen. It's moser at arthistory.ucsb.edu. And I'll just write it in the chat so that you can easily copy it if you want it. 
Um, please, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions whatsoever, even if it's like, how do I, you know, what classes can I take or, you know, what, what opportunities are there? What's it like majoring in the art history department? Um, is there any way to get involved with and get updates on Rome the game? Um, asked Tara. Uh, yes. Um, so what I would do, Tara, is I would look at the art history's web, uh, art history's, uh, website for UCSB, arthistory.uc, um, what, what is our website? <laughs> um, look at our history, the Department of, art, of History of Art and Architecture's website for art history, and um, we'll have, there's a, you can look at what courses are being offered for the fall, our fall courses are already listed, and I don't know off the top of my head um, when incoming freshmen get to register, but I do know that for Rome the Game, we are reserving spots for um, incoming freshmen, so, um, and if you guys have all now heard me talk, if you have any trouble getting into the class, there's my email address, email me directly. Um, oh, thank you, Jane. Um, Arthistory.ucsb.edu. I thought it might be that, but I didn't know if it was that simple. Um, those things when you have bookmarked on your page, on your computer. Um, so check the Art History website. Where I'm going to have a flyer up there about Rome the Game. Um, again, it's listed as Art History 6A, so it's not called Rome the Game. Um, it's called Art History... 6A. Um, and if you have any trouble with getting in, email me because as, as one of the professors to the course, I can certainly um, help you help you with that. Um, and incoming freshmen will register for fall courses as part of the summer orientation program. Thank you, Jamie. You have, I knew you would have all the information. And while we were talking, um, Noah asked, is the museum studies minor relevant for history majors? Yeah, certainly. Um, a lot of our museum studies minors come from everything from econ. Um, we have a lot of STEM um, ma majors who are minoring in museum studies. Um, a lot of, one of my former undergrads who's now getting her MA in museum studies was a museum, majored in history and had a museum studies minor as well. Um, so I think that it is, there's a lot of crossover over um, and that's why these minors are really appealing because you can you can major in a very different department and have it complement with with different minors so if there are no more questions please 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 don't hesitate to email me um, at any point um, uh, last year I did this last year and somebody who came to the came to the um, lecture ended up in one of my uh, courses in the fall um, sitting in the front row so it was great to see her there um, and I hope that I will have you guys all in classes at some point in the future okay well I hope everyone has a great night um, and a great evening or, or, or wherever you are and I look forward to seeing you guys on campus or remotely in the fall. Thank, thank you, you so much, Professor. That was fascinating. And thank you all for joining. I appreciate how interactive you all were. This was wonderful. Yes, me too. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions and for all the um, comments. And, and it, made it, it made a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Well, everyone, have a great rest of your evening. And thank you again, Professor. Yes, thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.